Hello YouTube, Bane666 here. So let's continue with Thomas Smith and the sentencing gap. You know, and that's what I want to get at. All of these factors, and, and it's again, it's largely in the hands of prosecutors, which is why when I always quote that, that thing, 95% of prosecutors are white. So I think it would be really foolish to imagine that doesn't make some sort of difference in terms of the racism in our system. Now, that is a very, very interesting point. What he's saying is because the majority of prosecutors are white, therefore there must be some racial bias against blacks, and that would account for the racial element of the sentencing gap. But the exact opposite is true when you come to gender. The majority of prosecutors are male, yet males in general still get discriminated against by the sentencing gap. So these two things are the exact opposite of one another. Unless, of course, you conclude that males are more likely to protect or give preferential treatment to women. Um, but that's a bit problematic if you're going to be preaching that we live in a patriarchy where males are seen as um, more important than women while at the same time claiming that all power is in the hands of men. These things just don't all fit together very neatly, do they? But in terms of the gender discrepancy, it can have the opposite effect. So the more women are involved in the process, the, the more this gap disappears. So one study found that if you have female judge, if you have you know female prosecutor, it reduces the discrepancy, actually. Now, Thomas doesn't link to this study which shows that female judges are harsher on female offenders than on male offenders. I'll admit that it might be possible, but I'd actually like to look at the study before making up my mind one way or the other. In the past, though, while talking about the sentencing gap, I have pointed to a study which showed that men tend to give preferential treatment to women and that women tend to give preferential treatment to women. Now, to be fair, this study was uh, generally, it wasn't about sentencing, but I don't see any reason why the findings in this study wouldn't also apply to sentencing. So I'm not convinced that female judges would have a great effect. I'm open to looking at the, the data and uh, changing my mind, but... I'm not convinced at this point. However, uh, one thing would be very, very harmful and would definitely make the sentencing gap a lot wider, and that is having more feminist judges and prosecutors. Uh, now, let me point out that's um, feminist regardless of whether they're male or female. And my reasoning is this. Feminism looks at the world through a gendered lens where men are typically the the perpetrators and women are typically the victims. Therefore, if you look at the world through the feminist lens, you are starting with a bias to begin with. You are more likely to view a male accused of something as guilty, and you are more likely to have sympathy towards a, a female who's claiming to be a victim, or sympathy towards a female who's the perpetrator who's also claiming to be a victim, which seems to be a very popular defense. So I don't have a problem with female judges or lawyers or prosecutors or whatever, but I do have a problem with people in general bringing their ideology into the courtroom. And that isn't just uh, feminist ideology. You could make the same argument for, um, I don't know, Christianity or Islam or communism or... Um, Scientology or whatever. What should be important is the facts of the case. And uh, you, you can't fully understand the facts of the case if you look at it through an ideological lens. So another reason to elect women to these to these roles where, where they are elected. Sometimes they're appointed, sometimes they're elected. Prosecutors are elected. Uh, so female prosecutors, that might be a good idea. But anyway, um, I, I want to talk about the false dichotomy part because... While I think the best argument you could make for the red pill people is that people don't pay enough attention to this. Yeah, it's, it's very surprising how the entire social justice movement is dead silent on the topic of the gender sentencing gap, isn't it, Thomas? It's a real mystery about how these people who 
who just want equality for everyone and you know they they want a society in which we we don't have racism or sexism uh just totally ignore this issue that affects men as if it doesn't exist that's it's a it's a real mystery how that happens because one of my sources here, I think this is really interesting, is a Reddit called R Ask Feminists. And someone posed this question. And they did it in a pretty much a bad faith way. It's a it's a trash account that, that they're trying to stir the pot. But nonetheless Okay, so Thomas claims that this question was said in bad faith. And uh if you actually look at the thread, someone makes exactly the same argument in the thread saying that you know it was made in bad faith uh so it's pretty clear thomas has just repeated what he's read on reddit but anyway this is an argument i've made numerous times in the past so maybe i should explain why i've brought up the sentencing gap the feminists like this in the past uh, the reason is because we are constantly being told by feminists that they're taking care of all our issues that feminism actually is for men too, and they're really concerned about men's issues. And that's why we don't need a men's rights movement, because feminism is doing it all. Now, the perfect counter-argument to this is, what about the sentencing gap? Now, I've brought this up numerous times in that context, and there are a set standard of responses I get. Uh, the first one is shock and surprise and ignorance so they have no idea what i'm talking about now this is the perfect reason why feminism isn't dealing with men's issues it's totally ignorant of many of them it's not spreading awareness about them and if you think it's dealing with all of men's issues you are very very ignorant about the topic and basically it's not concerned about many men's issues unless it can put the blame on men and somehow say it's patriarchal or toxic masculinity probably the second most common response i get is well that's because men commit more crimes um okay if you actually read the study it's comparing like cases with similar criminal histories it's not comparing a man who's committed 20 crimes to a woman who's committed one or a man who's committed murder to a woman who stole a handbag or something like that these are comparable crimes and men still get vastly longer sentences and then i get the ones who insist that this is all bullshit and women are the ones who get the longer sentences and it really doesn't matter how many studies or how much evidence you present to them, uh, they will insist that women still get longer sentences. And the reason why is their ideology basically controls their thinking. Their ideology is based on the assumption that men always have the advantage and are always privileged, and women are always disadvantaged and always the oppressed. And when you show them an example of men being disadvantaged and women having advantage, they just can't wrap their minds around it. It doesn't compute. It doesn't fit their world model. So they have to reject it outright. And then there are the ones who say, that's terrible. Maybe we should do something about it. And those ones I give full credit to. Um, although I think many of them go on to totally forget about it and do absolutely nothing about it because there aren't really that many feminists talking about the sentencing gap. In fact, uh, I think I can count them on two hands. Now, I, I have said in the past that I could count them on one hand. That has slightly changed since the Red Pill movie came out. I have seen some coffee shop feminists who have done fair reviews of the Red Pill. Uh, you know, those feminists who don't work in the media and who have actually watched the movie and actually do care about equality. And some of them have mentioned the sentencing gap. So, once again, it's MRAs educating feminists, even though feminists claim that, you know, their MRAs aren't needed because they're doing everything for us. Uh, and by the way, Thomas is on that list. Uh, he never brought up the gender sentencing gap until he watched the Redfield movie. But considering Thomas is about to go into the 
Ask Feminist Reddit as his uh, a main source of evidence, apparently, I thought I'd have a quick look at the thread in question. So there are 22 comments in this thread. So you might think that Thomas is using a sample size of 22 to make his argument, but that would be false. Uh, because it's pretty clear reading the thread that some people in there aren't feminists. They're either MRAs or anti-feminists or, or whatever, but they're arguing against um, some of the feminists in there. And another point I should bring up is that there are multiple posts by individuals who are arguing back and forth. There's a couple of people arguing about uh, the death penalty and how men are more likely to be killed because of a death penalty than women. So we could probably very easily half that 22. And that's probably me being generous. So it's an extremely small sample size presented by Thomas, which is apparently meant to um, show us the entire feminist perspective on the sentencing gap. So I thought I would be fair and have a look at some of the other threads talking about the sentencing gap. That is, if there are any other ones. Well... The second one in, in my search has a list of resources showing that feminists actually care about men's issues and are talking about men's issues. And uh, under sentencing disparity, there are four links. Now, one of those links is an article on the Good Men Project, which I've talked about in a previous, episode, um, previous uh, video on the sentencing gap. That was in my response to Garrett. And the article does make some good points. Then there is an article on iFeminist. Now, if we actually look at the article, we find a very interesting thing. Uh, it's actually from 2004, and it's an article which was originally published by the Los Angeles chapter of the National Coalition of Free Men. So the next one we should look at is a link to a study called Sex-Based Sentencing, Sentencing Disparities Between Male and Female Sex Offenders. So it's talking about a very specific thing. Uh, I haven't gone through the whole study. That might be a, a topic for a future video. But it does seem to be um, supporting the notion that men get longer sentences for sexual crimes, at least. It seems to be very specific on that one crime and not in general. And the fourth link is to a blog, which is talking about the Sonia Star study. So not a great deal of um, feminists doing stuff about the uh, sentencing gap. There's one study about differences when it comes to sexual crimes. There's a blog talking about the Sonia Star study. There's a feminist webpage reprinting a men's rights article and an article on the Good Men Project. Not a great deal of resources. So the third thread I found about the sentencing gap on Ask Feminists um, is a link to a Karen Strawn video talking about the sentencing gap, and the poster is asking what people think of it. It's got, in the video, it is argued that men face systematic and institutional sexism in areas such as the sentencing gap, education gap, and teacher biases. So the top comment is uh, very, very angry. I'll put it up on the screen. You can pause it and read it if you want. But it basically makes the argument that uh, the Karen doesn't know what she's talking about and she's extremely ignorant and that the reason why there are more men in prison is because men commit more crimes. And, and how dare she tell feminists what they should be talking about? It's all about the mitigating circumstances of course, this poster didn't check the citations because the very top citation in Karen's video is the Sonia Star study. Uh, once again, that's comparing like cases to like cases. But I guess that would be too much work to actually check the citations before ranting like a lunatic. Now, here's an interesting one. It's a, this is the fourth one I found on Ask Feminists. Someone's asked the question, why does the prison gap get so little discussion in feminist circles. So the top comment from Cheesy Chips is, you say the same crime, but the reality is even the same crime on paper is actually very different. When played out in reality, we know that women and men conduct largely different crimes and their roles within an individual crime is very different. 
take two armed robbers. One might have been the gang leader who initiated the crime and pointed a gun at a clerk and took the money. The other might have been an accomplice to the crime and held a gun within the place but didn't proceed any further. Now these crimes are both armed robbery, but the severity or depth of the crime are vastly different. Also, when a crime is not the first crime committed, the effect actually reverses, with women getting longer sentences. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not true, by the way. Is the number of men in prison a women's issue? Or an issue of gender even? It should be discussed in other specific forums to prison rates, perhaps liberal forums. And then she goes on to talk about how we should be talking about women in prison as the primary focus of feminism. Uh, someone's commented, Why doesn't Peter fight for autism awareness? Must be some excuse about how their focus is on animals and they don't have time to care about autism. So basically this person is saying, well, feminism isn't talking about men's issues because it's focused on female issues. Okay then, uh, stop claiming that feminism is covering men's issues and leave the men's rights activists to deal with those. In other words, get the fuck out of our way. Um, anyway, back to Thomas. Now that we've looked at his his uh, evidence, uh, let's, let's go back to Thomas and let's hear his argument. Yes. This Reddit thread of Ask Feminists is actually designed for things like this, where if you want to know what feminists think on an issue, or at least the feminists that are on this Reddit thread, but they're somewhat representative, um, then you can pose the question and they'll answer. And this question is posed, what do you think about the 60% discount on prison sentences? Which, by the way, is, is incorrect. In it, it's Men's sentences are 60% longer, 63% longer. It's not a 60% discount, so that, that's the opposite. But anyway, uh, it, it was posed in sort of an inflammatory way. They didn't offer any proof. They didn't reference the study. But nonetheless, feminists still answered, and all of them said, yeah, well, we should just sentence men shorter. <laughs> it wasn't as though any of the feminists said, Oh, good, you know, because women, yeah, they, they're they fine. We don't want to sense it. We want to imp imprison men. Now, I would argue 10 or so commenters on a Reddit thread is not a good sample size to represent the entirety of feminism. So I thought I would go and have a look on one of the, um, the major feminist websites on the internet and see if I could find anything about the gender sentencing gap. So I went to Everyday Feminism and I found quite a few articles talking about prison and sentencing. So let's have a very quick look at some of them. Uh, the first one here is three reasons prison injustice is a feminist issue that needs our attention now. Well, that sounds uh, hopeful because we're told that feminism actually cares about men and men's issues and it's about equality. So surely one of these three reasons would be that men get longer sentences for exactly the same crimes, right? And if we go to reason number three, it's titled, It's a Gender Issue. Well, that sounds hopeful. Let's have a read and see what they say. Feminism began by focusing on gender justice. And the third truth to ground in is the fact that fighting prison injustice is very much a matter of fighting for gender justice. Well, that, that sounds hopeful. It sounds like they're going to say something about the gender sentencing gap, doesn't it? Since 1985, the number of women incarcerated has increased at nearly double the rate of men. Oh, okay. Well, maybe they mention it a little bit later. Let's, let's continue. Through an intersectional lens, we see rates increasing even more at the intersections of identities. Black women as the fastest growing prison population are three times more likely than white women to be incarcerated and Latino women are 69% more likely. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure they're just about to mention the gender sentencing gap any second though. Let's continue. One in five transgender women has been incarcerated at some point in her life with an even higher rate at 47% of black transgender people. Poor women are criminalized simply for the fact of being poor. 
and for many of the survival tactics low-income people use to survive. Um, yes, because I, I guess poverty doesn't have any impact on uh, male criminals at all. Um, well, I, we do live in a patriarchy, so I guess all men are well off or something. In the age of Ferguson, you may have heard many conversations about state violence as it relates to black and brown men. Oh, well, men did get a mention there, but only uh, only black and brown men. Um, uh, it, it seems that men don't get a mention unless they're black or brown men. Uh, now, I've got no problem with being inclusive of black and brown men. And once again, as I've said in previous videos, race definitely is a factor. But gender is a bigger factor. And for some reason, it's not mentioned here. How strange. It's uh, maybe, maybe they mention it in a different article. Here's another one. What are the odds you'll go to prison? Hmm, well, I'm I'm guessing they'll say the odds um, that you'll go to prison are much higher if you're a male, right? That is, a male who's committed exactly the same crime as a female with similar criminal history. They're bound to mention that somewhere here, because feminism is about equality. The chances of a white guy going to prison is 1 out of 17, but for black guys, the chances are 1 out of 3. Uh, uh, what, are, what are the chances for a woman? Are you... Oh, you're not going to mention that. Oh. That's a shame. It seems that they're just talking about race again. Let's go on to another one. Five ways the US prison system is more about perpetuating oppression and not about stemming crime. Well, this is bound to mention the uh, the sentencing gap. The gender sentencing gap. Let's go through the five reasons. Black and Latino men are incarcerated at rates widely exceeding the rates of white men. Um, yeah, what about men in general? Uh, I guess I guess men in general just don't count unless they're black or Latino. Oh, and what about point three? Women are being incarcerated at higher rates, especially women of colour. Oh, gee, that, that seems uh, unfair, doesn't it? Hmm... I mean, if you were just to read these articles, it, it sounds like uh, you, you're pretty lucky if you're a white male who commits a crime because it's only black and Latino men who get harsher sentences. And let's not forget, well, women are being sentenced. So they must be the only groups that have issues with sentencing, uh, right? Oh, look, maybe they mentioned the gender sentencing gap in another article. So let's have a look at another one. The shocking numbers behind the U.S.'s exploding women prison population. Oh, uh, I guess that's not going to mention uh, the gender sentencing gap. Let's have a look at another one. Seven critical pieces of info about the death penalty that you need to know ASAP. Okay, for the record, I'm against the death penalty. I'm not going to go into a long discussion about why here, because this video is going to be long enough as it is. But I will say I actually agree with some of the points they make in this article. But let's have a look at number five. The death penalty disproportionately targets people of colour. Uh, now this is true, there are more black males on death row than white males. That is, proportionately, when you take into account the percentage of the population which are black. But there's vastly more males on death row than uh, than females. So shouldn't there be an argument that the death penalty disproportionately targets males? Of course not, because uh, everyday feminism doesn't give two shits about males unless they're males of colour. In which case, they don't care about the male part. They just care about the colour part. Let's have a look at another article. Criminal Injustice, Five Disturbing Facts About Women of Colour and the Prison Industrial Complex. Number one, women and girls of colour are funnelled into the prison industrial complex. Number two, there's more women of colour in prison than ever. Number three, self-defence is a crime for women of colour. Oh, and have a look what we've got here. This is... Uh, this is rather interesting. It says 90% of women 
in prison for killing men are there because those men abused them. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Now, I notice there's no citation here, but clearly this comes from the same 90% figure which I debunked last episode. Now, the actual thing I debunked last episode was as many as 90% of women. Now, as many as 90% is a rather inaccurate term. I, I don't know exactly how they came to that figure, but I'm guessing they've just included every single woman who has claimed self-defense. Now, obviously, not everyone using self-defense as a claim in court is going to be telling the truth. So it's an extremely inaccurate number. Uh, but I see that they've taken away the as many as part of the uh, stat and just stated that it's 90% of women now with absolutely no citation. Yeah. Not to mention that that stat came from about 30 years ago. So you could argue that a lot has changed since then. Four, for women of colour, prison can break their families. Yeah, because going to prison doesn't really affect men and their families, does it? Five, it can be harder for women of colour to re-establish their lives after prison. So what we find over and over and over again on Everyday Feminism is they're willing to talk about prisons and how it affects people, but only if those people are female or if they're trans or if they're black, or if they're Latino. Uh, nowhere can I find them talking about males as a group, regardless of race or regardless of sexual orientation, being disproportionately affected by sentencing, and how that is a, a violation of human rights. I can't find them talking about that anywhere. They're happy to talk about black men and Latino men and trans men and definitely happy to talk about women especially women of color but absolutely nothing about men in general and the reason for this is very very simple it's because they're looking at the world through the feminist lens and only certain groups in their opinion deserve to be recognized when it comes to having issues but continue thomas continue talking about your 10 or 11 feminists on a, a subreddit so while you may be able to find some insane Tumblr feminist somewhere who thinks that men should be imprisoned... I think this should be a new fallacy. Um, I think we should call it something like the Tumblr fallacy, and it's where a feminist like Thomas will dismiss any arguments against the mainstream feminist movement by simply stating that, well, sure, there's some people like that, but they're only a handful of crazies over on Tumblr, and no one takes them seriously, which, of course, is nonsense. Yes, there are crazies on Tumblr, no doubt about that. Uh, but there's also crazies in the mainstream media and in feminist academics, and uh, across the board, pretty much. So let me counter your 10 or 11 people on Reddit who think that the sentencing gap should go away with a couple of feminists who are more high profile and have more influence. First of all, there's Professor Patricia O'Brien. Now, she's an associate professor at the Jane Addams College of Social Work at University of Illinois at Chicago. And she wrote a wonderful article called we should stop putting women in jail for anything. She says, The argument is actually quite straightforward. There are far fewer women in prison than men to start with. Uh, yeah, that's because women are less likely to be sentenced to prison. Um, that's, that's part of the problem. Women make up just 7% of the prison population. This means that these women are disproportionately affected by a system designed for men. Uh, no, that means that they've committed crimes and they've been locked up. Uh, that fucking simple. But could women's prisons actually be eliminated in the United States, where the rate of women's incarceration has risen by 646% in the last 30 years? The context is different, but many of the arguments are the same. Yeah. Or I could put forward Professor Mirko Bagaric. Now, 
Professor Mirko Bagaric is the director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Sentencing at Deakin University, Melbourne. Uh, evidence-based sentencing. Well, he must be against the sentencing gap, right? That that would make sense. Oh no, no, he's actually wanting to widen the gap. Here's an article by him. Why we should close women's prisons and treat their crimes more fairly. More fairly? They they already get less of a sentence, or no sentence, for the, exactly the same crimes. How much more fairly could they be treated? Sentencing systems around the world should be radically reformed to start with the assumption that women should not be sent to prison for their crimes. Uh, yes, we should start with the assumption that the person who committed the crime should not go to prison, but only if they're a woman, right? And once again, this is the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Sentencing. That's fucking fantastic, isn't it? And of course, all this started well over a decade ago. I can go back to the report by Baroness Jean Corston, who started the uh, the present debate in England over shutting all women's prisons. Now, as far as I know, Thomas, uh, none of these people are on Tumblr. Uh, none of them are Tumblr feminists. Um, there's two academics, two professors, actually, and a baroness. A, a baroness who started a task force in England to shut down women's prisons. A task force which has an influence on the English government. Um, yep. So, keep on trying to diminish the influence of these types of feminists, Thomas, by, by claiming it's just a handful of lunatics on Tumblr. Uh, and I'll keep on pointing out how you're fucking wrong. Now, let me stress, I'm not saying all feminists believe this, but when Thomas dismisses these type of feminists who are actually trying to make the sentencing gap wider, he's effectively being a shield for them. And he is effectively working against closing the gap. He should be calling them out. If he actually cares about this issue, he should be calling out these feminists instead of trying to make excuses for them. That's not representative. And in fact, this Reddit thread is very interesting. I, I see in this Reddit thread a lot of people trying to find the data. Some person offered the actual study that I referenced and said, oh, I think it's coming from this. Lots of good faith efforts to evaluate this question. Okay, so just to be 100% clear, what Thomas has brought to the table as his example is someone called Stab Whale and another person called I Fake It, who seems to be a radical feminist, who have posted on Reddit, uh, whereas I bring to the table university professors, some of which have influence on the government. Now, which one do you think we should be more concerned about, Thomas? Which one do you think we should be discussing more? The opinions of Stab Whale on Reddit or university professors who are actively trying to widen the gap and have influence on governments around the world? Gee, that's a hard question. Um, yeah. It's, it's hard to figure out which one we should be more concerned about and spend more time talking about. Which I think is representative of what I see from the feminists I know, which is a willingness to engage in these questions and a willingness to say, yeah, this does disproportionately affect men. However, the reason is toxic masculinity or toxic gender roles, you know, like that's a big reason for it. So seeing women as more harmless or uh, as inherently victims, all that kind of stuff, that is gender roles. And now, this is fucking hilarious. Just about every single feminist argument is based upon seeing women as victims and men as perpetrators. The whole argument I discussed in the last video about females who murder their partners being excused as doing it in self-defense is exactly that. Now, now let me stress, I, I do admit there are some cases where females kill their partners in self-defense, but you will see feminists defend anyone, no matter the circumstances, as long as they're female. They will believe any story, no matter how ludicrous, as long as they're female. 
because they see the world as females being oppressed and males being the oppressors. The whole thing is built on female victimhood. In fact, Thomas is guilty of this himself. When he had his talk with Sargon, we'll call it a talk, he brought up the tweet that Sargon sent to Jess Phillips. And Thomas was talking about Jess Phillips as if she was this traumatized victim, uh, this, this victim of sexual assault, and I think he even referred to it as rape at one point. Awful. Exactly. That is an unacceptable exactly. thing opinion. to say to somebody. To tell a rape victim, a sexual assault victim, I wouldn't even rape you, is Why? disgusting. Why? This poor victim who was almost you know, afraid to go on the internet because of this terrible, terrible thing that Sargon had done. Uh, when in reality, Jess Phillips' sexual assault was being groped in a pub 20 years ago. Now, obviously that's wrong, but it's a long way away from the traumatizing rape that Thomas was portraying it as. And she commented about the tweet as um, not being important and not paying attention to it. And she had a day off and went and played with her children in the garden. I mean, that's that's hardly being fucking traumatized by a tweet bank holiday i was actually whilst these people think that i'm sitting around playing the victim i was playing games in the garden with my children most of the day so i don't i don't let it bother me so why did thomas do that then if jess didn't really see it as a big deal and dismissed it as unimportant and said that she doesn't let things like that get to her then why did thomas make such a big fuss about it well as far as i can see there's two possibilities the first possibility was he was doing his very best impersonation of a white knight. In which case, yes, he, he is guilty of the exact thing that he was just criticizing the legal system for. He diminished Jess Phillips to a victim based on the fact that she's female. And then he rode in on his white horse to defend her. That's the very fucking problem, Thomas. Don't you fucking understand that you're part of the fucking problem when you do this? Now, the other alternative isn't really much better. The other alternative is he knew that Jess Phillips was not affected by this. And he purposely exaggerated the effect. And purposely turned her into a victim to score political points against Sargon. Now, either of these options are not good, Thomas. And both of them are reinforcing the very fucking stereotypes you just claim to be against. Do you not realize this? Are you that fucking blind that you can't see that you are part of the problem? That you are actually reinforcing these gender stereotypes that you fucking claim to be against? Do you not see that you are a massive fucking hypocrite? And I think it's very telling that the only evidence of feminists supporting dismantling the, the sentencing gap that Thomas presents is 10 or so feminists on Ask Feminism. He doesn't present any influential or well-known feminists talking about it or saying it should be dismantled or, you know, we should change it. He doesn't present anything from any major feminist publications. All he presents is 10 or 11 feminists responding to a question from an anti-feminist or a men's rights activist. And it's pretty clear that those feminists would not be talking about that issue if that anti-feminist or MRA did not bring it up, just as Thomas would not be talking about it if he hadn't watched the red pill. Yet we're told that feminism is taking care of all of men's issues, right? Sure, Thomas. Sure it is. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there for this episode. I was hoping to get through the last 10 or 11 minutes of uh, Thomas this episode, but I think I only got about halfway through it. So it looks like there's going to be a third episode on Thomas Smith and the sentencing gap. So just to finish off the video, I want to have a quick look at a study that came out in 2010 from my home state of Victoria. 
I actually wanted to look at this last episode, but when I was making uh, last episode, I came across another study which I thought was more appropriate for the uh, the end of that video, considering it was about domestic violence, and I focused so much of last episode on uh, domestic violence and the sentencing gap. So here I am looking at that study now. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want to go through the executive summary and have a look at the way it excuses female behavior to justify the sentencing gap. And I'm going to be using Sonia Starr's study to debunk this, as well as that article from 1992 that you might remember from last episode. You know, the one that feminists like to quote that 90% figure from? There's some very interesting information in that, which actually debunks this study from 2010. And yes, I know the article is 26 years old, but I think you'll agree with me that if the information was correct then, it would still be correct now. You'll see what I mean when we get to it. Uh, but as always, if someone disagrees with that and thinks for some reason that that information has dramatically changed in the last 26 years, I'm more than happy to look at a, a new study or new information. Uh, I would be shocked if it has, though. So the study from Victoria is called Gender Differences in Sentencing Outcomes, and it's by the Sentencing Advisory Council. Executive Summary Gender differences in criminal court outcomes for men and women are almost axiomatic in contemporary criminology. Since the early 1970s a plethora of studies in the United States has found evidence of discrimination in sentencing. While most of these studies initially focused on issues of racial discrimination, an increasing number of researchers have since turned their attention to the examination of gender differences in court processing outcomes. This paper examines the research literature and presence data from Victoria, Australia, to consider differences in sentencing outcomes for men and women. Data on gender differences in police recorded offending and in prison statistics are also included in order to complete the picture. Findings from the analyses of Victorian police, courts and prison data are broadly consistent with the large body of literature in this field. In particular, Several key conclusions can be drawn from these analyses. Men and women have different patterns of criminal behavior. Women's offending tends to be less serious in terms of the nature of the criminal behavior, with women being less likely to be involved in violent offenses. Uh, now this is irrelevant. If we look at the Sonia Starr study, we will find that when comparing like cases with similar criminal histories, men still get vastly longer sentences. So if we were to compare a violent crime by a woman compared to a violent crime by a man with similar circumstances and history, we will find that the man still gets a longer sentence. And if we compare non-violent crimes in a similar way, we will find that the man still gets a longer sentence. So saying women on average commit less violent crimes is not a rebuttal. In the Victorian County and Supreme Courts, overall women are less likely to be sentenced to a term of imprisonment and, when they are, women receive shorter average total effective terms. For most offenses women are more likely to be sentenced to a wholly suspended sentence or a community-based order, both of which are served in the community rather than in custody. In the Magistrates Court of Victoria, women are less likely to receive a sentence of imprisonment for all of the offense categories examined. For most of the offense types, women receive a shorter term of imprisonment than do men. Women's sentences are shorter as they are more likely than men to have a constellation of factors that can validly reduce the length of a sentence. A constellation of factors that can validly reduce the length of a sentence. Okay, we will be looking at this constellation of factors in a minute. Next. The profile of men and women in Victorian prisons is substantially different. Women prisoners have less serious criminal histories than do men, with fewer prior convictions and less serious previous and current offending in terms of the type of offenses for which they have been imprisoned. Okay, so it's the less serious criminal history excuse. Now, once again, Sonia Starr took that into consideration, and there is still a massive gap. So it is not an actual argument. There is still a gender bias there. But if we look at 
first offence history, we find that men still get longer sentences. Here's a clip of Philip Davies arguing this very point in Parliament in England. The Ministry of Justice's publication called Statistics on Women and the Criminal Justice System, November 2010, which is produced to ensure there is no sex discrimination in the system, says, and I quote, of sentenced first-time offenders, 7,320 females and 25,936 males, a greater percentage of males were sentenced to immediate custody than females, 29% compared with 17%, which has been the case in each year since 2005. So those people who have had the briefing from the Prison Reform Trust, which tries to persuade them that women with no previous convictions are more likely to be sent to prison than men, that is categorically not the case, as the Ministry of Justice's own publication makes abundantly clear. Of course I will. I'm very grateful do congratulate him for providing us with this opportunity to help him with his understanding of this issue. But isn't it right that first offending, for, well, the convictions for first offence for women offenders for the same offence, they are more likely to receive a custodial sentence? And I don't think he's got the figures for that. No, no, they're not, Mrs Osborne. That's the whole point. They are not. For every category of offence, men are more likely to be sent to prison than women. And according to the Ministry of Justice's own publication, First-time offenders, men, are but not just slightly, they're much more likely to be sent to prison than women. That is the, that is the fact. So if I can just explain again, what I'm saying is that for the same offence for the first time. Now what, you're, what the gentleman has the figures for is first-time offending overall and for different categories of offence. But if you take the same offence for men and for women, for the first conviction, they are more likely to get a custodial sentence. No, they are not, Mrs Osborne, they are not. And I've got, for the benefit of the Honourable Lady, I've got every single category of offence, and I've got the, the uh, likelihood of men and women from exactly the same offence being sent to prison. I'm afraid what she's saying is simply not the case. This figure shows that the average male prison sentence is over 50% more than the average female prison sentence. That's something that those who are alleged to be so keen on equality should think about. Of course, I'll give way. And it is, of course, important to understand what some of the factors behind these figures might be. For example, a substantially higher proportion of women in prison are first-time offenders, 29% compared with 12% of men. Naturally, therefore, you would expect the sentencing for first-time offenders to be set at a lower level than for those with a pattern of offending behaviour. Now, I'm not suggesting, Mrs Osborne, that explains all of the difference in the figures, but I do think that it's important that the Honourable Gentleman gives us the full analysis and not just the headlines. Well, it, it's equally important, Mrs Osborne, that the Honourable Lady listens to what I'm saying, because if she had have been listening to what I'm saying, rather than perhaps wrapped up in her brief from the Prison Reform Trust, she would have known that I'll just repeat it for her benefit. We've all heard it once, but I'll repeat it for her benefit. This is from the Ministry of Justice's own publication, Statistics on Women and the Criminal Justice System, of sentenced first-time offenders, 7,320 females and 25,936 males, a greater percentage of males were sentenced to immediate custody than females, 29% compared with 17%, which has been the case in each year since 2005. So rather than the Honourable Lady suggesting that more female first-time offenders are more likely to be sent to prison than men, that is simply not the case. She's saying that a higher proportion of women in prison are first-time offenders. That's because they're so li less likely to be sent to prison <laughs> unless they commit particularly serious offences where the courts have got no option but to send them to prison. It's a complete distortion of the facts, and the Ministry of Justice publication makes that perfectly clear. They also tend to be sent to prison for shorter periods, likely a reflection of their less serious offending and their more complex personal histories and situations. Uh, once again, we see the less serious offending argument, which Sonia Starr debunked. If you compare like cases, men still get a longer sentence. And we also see the complex personal histories and situations argument, the constellation of factors, as uh, the author put it before. Now, we will be going deeper into these things in a moment. The biographies of female offenders vary systematically from those of men contributing to their blurred status as both victims and offenders. Uh, the blurred status as both victim and offenders. 
Yes, because if a man commits a crime, it's, well, it's because he's a man and it's his responsibility and he has total autonomy and, well, he shouldn't have done it, right? But if a woman commits a crime, well, that's different. You know, it's the patriarchy and she was abused when she was young and she's got a drug addiction and mental illness and it's not really her fault. It's never her fault. It's it's society. It's it's everything else. It's anything but her. An ex-boyfriend sent her an abusive message one time, which shows that she's a victim of domestic abuse. Therefore, it's not her fault. It was purely done in self-defense, and we can't blame her for anything because women have no autonomy, apparently. Right? This is at the heart of the sentencing gap. This bullshit holding men and women to different standards and having different criteria, being more sympathetic to women's excuses and ignoring men's. Next. Women are more likely than men to have a history of factors that are often causally interrelated, such as mental illness, physical or sexual victimization in childhood or early adulthood, and substance abuse. Oh, really? So women are more likely to have a history of factors like mental illness and physical or sexual victimization in childhood or early adulthood, and, of course, substance abuse, because there's no men in prison because of substance abuse. No, that, that would never, that's just laughable. That would never happen. Uh, but let's have a look at the Boston Globe article from 1992 that feminists love to quote, because there's a very, very interesting little comment from... The Chief of Behavioral Sciences for the FBI. I'm, I'm guessing he kind of knows what he's talking about, so let's hear what he had to say. But Eileen Warnos, who authorities say killed seven men, is the first woman in FBI annals accused in the multiple killing of strangers, a series of murders that span several years. In many respects, Warnos, a bisexual prostitute whose alleged victims had picked her up for sex, fits the profile of a male killer. She has the characteristics we see with our male killers, said John Douglas, Unit Chief of Behavioral Sciences for the FBI at Quantico, Virginia. Like many of our male killers, she comes from a very dysfunctional background where she was abused, physically and sexually. But usually women from that kind of background internalize the abuse and their feelings. While the men turn to aggression, the women turn to alcohol, drugs, prostitution and suicide. Women who have been badly abused as children also tend to get involved with violent men who abuse them and their children, perpetuating the cycle of violence into the next generation. One 1991 study by New York University researchers found that 21 females who had been incarcerated for criminal behavior as teenagers did not, as many of their male counterparts did, commit violent crimes as adults. Instead the majority became enmeshed in violent relationships, abused or neglected their children, and lost custody of them as a result. Well, that's interesting. The unit chief of the behavioral sciences for the FBI, at least back in 1992, I don't know what he's doing at the moment, said that male killers are more likely to have a history of physical and sexual abuse and come from dysfunctional backgrounds. That's kind of the opposite of what this Victorian report is saying, isn't it? Do you think maybe coming from a physically and sexually abusive background might make someone more violent when they're an adult? I, I think it would. But apparently that's not a consideration if you're a man. It's a perfectly fine consideration if you're a woman who commits a crime. Uh, but if you're a man who commits a crime, apparently, well, it doesn't count for some reason. Oh, and of course, we should look at what Sonia Starr said in her study about this. From this perspective, one might think differently about some of the possible explanations for the gender gap. Most defendants of both genders have suffered serious hardship, have mental health or addiction issues, have minor children, and or have followed others onto a criminal path. Sentencing law provides very limited formal mechanisms to account for such factors, which is probably why, with women, they appear to mostly be considered sub rosa. If prosecutors, judges, and legislators are comfortable with those factors playing a role in the sentencing of women, then perhaps it is worth explicitly reconsidering their place in criminal sentencing more generally.
Yes, and I would agree totally. Um, if we're going to say that a history of being a victim of violence and sexual abuse is a factor, then it should be applied equally to both men and women. Next. Women are also more likely than men to have primary caregiver status. Ah, uh, now this is another excuse that women are more likely to be primary caregivers. Uh, this is one I hear all the time. So let's have a listen to what Sonia Starr had to say about it. Another possibility is that prosecutors and or judges worry about the effect of maternal incarceration on children. The estimates are robust to controls for marital status and number of dependents, but these variables do not capture all differences in care responsibilities, including custody status. Other research shows that female defendants are far more likely than men to have primary or sole custody and incarcerating women more often results in foster care placements. See Hagen and Dinovitzer 1999 for a review of the literature. Cobb in 1983. In an experiment asking judges to give hypothetical sentences based on short vignettes, Freiberger 2010 found that mentioning childcare reduced judges' probability of recommending prison, but mentioning financial support for children did not. The child care theory suggests that one would expect to see the largest gender disparities among single parents, and the smallest among defendants with no children. That expectation is borne out by the data, compare Table 5, Columns 6-8. The Tut estimate is still over 50% among childless defendants, however, so the child care theory appears not to fully explain the gender gap, but it probably explains part of it. On the other hand, the decompositions in Table 7 indicate that, at most, between 1% and 2% of the sentencing gap can be explained by disproportionate invocation of the official, family hardship, departure in the sentencing guidelines. Women in the sample received that departure at three times the rate of men, 2.4% of cases versus 0.8%. But because the departure is so rare for both genders, it cannot explain much of the overall disparity. This is presumably because it requires extraordinary circumstances, and judges typically hold that single parenthood does not suffice, see USSG. 5H1.6. Redder 2006. Likewise, the main federal sentencing statute, 18 U.S.C. 3553, does not mention family hardship, and the guidelines affirmatively instruct that family ties are not ordinarily relevant. Federal sentencing law is not designed to provide much accommodation for defendants' children. In short, the family status gender interaction appears to be more substantial than the one formal legal mechanism for accommodating family hardship can explain. Prosecutors and or judges seem to use their discretion to accommodate family circumstances in sub rosa ways, but not for male defendants. Among single men, conditional on observables, Having children significantly increases sentences, and among married men, children make no significant difference. There are many competing arguments concerning whether family status is a proper sentencing consideration, see, for example, Markle, Collins, and Lieb 2007, and I will not address them here. However, if family hardship is a legitimate consideration, one might expect it to play at least some role in men's cases as well. Numerous studies have suggested that paternal incarceration harms children even when the father was already a non-custodial parent. See Hagen and Dinovitzer 1999 for a review. So, yes, this is a factor, but it is a minor factor that doesn't account for the entire gap. And it is still discriminatory against males. Even if males are the primary caregivers, it is less likely to be taken into consideration than if they were female. And fathers in general and the impact they have on their children's lives are generally not taken into account at all. Next. The effect of gender on sentencing is not direct, but travels via two distinct paths, via gender differences in offending behavior, and via the individual biographies of women that see a greater proportion of women coming before the court with a constellation of characteristics that creates legitimate mitigating circumstances. It is these mitigating factors that lead to disparities in sentencing outcomes for men and women in the criminal courts, disparities that appear warranted and that are not immediately indicative of any pervasive bias.
Ah, uh, so it's not actually a gender bias. It's the fact that women have legitimate excuses for why they commit crimes. And and let's face it, you know, they really don't commit that many crimes at all. So we really shouldn't bother putting them in prison for anything. But, you know, when, when they do commit crimes, there there's so many reasons. It's the troubled childhood and an abusive background and, and drug addiction and all these other things which apparently have absolutely no effect on male offenders whatsoever, uh, even though the guy from the FBI would say otherwise. So what this is telling us is that there is massive consideration for females. There is empathy and sympathy towards females when they go before the court. But, you know, not so much for men, because men are autonomous and have to take full responsibility for their actions, unlike females, apparently. Next. Thus, the disparities seen in sentencing outcomes for men and women are a reflection of legitimate but gender-linked characteristics. Differences are evident because of factors associated with being female, not because of gender per se. And all this boils down to is excuses. Uh, that's all it is. 